Welcome to the IMAG Multiscale Modeling Consortium webinar series. And my name is Grace Peng, and I am the chair of the Interagency Modeling and Analysis Group. I am pleased to introduce Dr. Bill Litton, who is one of the co-leads for the Clinical and Translational Issues Working Group of the Multiscale Modeling Consortium. Um, I'll hand it over to Bill to introduce the speaker. So it's a pleasure to introduce Terry Colin, who is an applied mathematician from the University of Bordeaux. Uh, I'm reading from some notes here that um, Mark Garvey provided me with, uh, which are very flattering to TRE, I must say. Uh, he has gotten his training from a Col Normale Superior, which is the uh, top uh, school for mathematicians in France, and, and uh, admit uh, only a very select group of people. And after that, uh, he was drawn to uh, mathematical physics, and then uh, from there moved on to medical applications. He uh, received his PhD in the early 90s and uh, started writing math papers at the at age of 22, he graduated 15 PhD students, a third of which whom are now faculty at various places. He's uh, now turned his interest to cancer and uh, has been able to transpose some of the ideas of continuous mechanics to tu tumor growth, as uh, have as several other people, uh, in his uh, paper of 2009 in Journal of Theoretical Biology on Multiscale Modeling of Angiogenesis was uh, a groundbreaking paper, really first um, serious attempt to bring multi-scale modeling to a clinical translational side. So he's working more and more with clinicians and uh, moving further, uh, closer and closer to a real clinical application that can be brought into the hospital and, uh, and applied directly to patients. So uh, I'd like to introduce Thierry and his topic, which will be the mathematical modeling of tumor growth. Thank you, Thierry. <clears throat> Thank you, Bill. So thank you for the invitation to speak in this uh, webinar. It's the first time that I do something like that, so please apologize, uh, by the way, my f typical French English. But if you know Mark, uh, you, you won't be surprised by the accent, probably. OK, so since I have started to work on mathematical biology and application of mathematics to, to, to medical, uh, medical sciences, uh, I had a switch in around 2009-2010 when uh, I just realized that making mathematical models and doing uh, simulation without data in this context can be something that, that is meaning, uh, uh, meaningless. And so in, uh, roughly f five years ago, I decided to uh, read, to, to meet medical doctors and try to see what kind of data are uh, are we really available uh, from the medical part, and what kind of question also can be uh, can be answered with uh, with mathematical model? So it's a, it was the beginning of a long collaboration with a physician mainly from Bordeaux because it's, uh, it's easier to have collaboration with medical doctor here than uh, from from abroad. It's because it takes time and you need a lot of time to to speak the same language and to understand which kind of data can be can be used. So I'm trying to do to, uh, today to uh, to show you two examples of problem we have uh, we have uh, we have tried to, to answer. So okay, the first example I, uh, I want to talk about today it's this one. This is uh, so you, you what you can see on the screen it's CT scan uh, of uh, of the, the lung of a patient. So it, this patient had a bladder cancer that was treated. And so in June 2008, a uh, metastasis uh, was discovered on the, on the right lung. So uh, on this part, this small, uh, this small, uh, this small ball here. I, I don't. Yes, you see. Uh, you see when, when I show on the screen. So this small ball here is a metastasis, and as you can see, it is this, this thing here is a blood vessel, and so the metastasis just uh, just grow from uh, from the blood, the blood vessel. In September. It was uh, like that, and so the medical doctor decided to. Uh, it was in a, in a hospital in the countryside, and so he, he decided to, uh, to to address his, uh, his case uh, by uh, by asking the, the patient to to visit a special center in Bordeaux, which is uh, it's an hospital which is specialized in cancer therapy, in order to uh, to, to to have radio frequency ablation. So radio frequency ablation is a technique. That is used uh, for uh, isolating metastasis 
And as long as they are not too, uh, too large. Too large means uh, three centimeters of the diameter. And it's very efficient. It's, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not surgery. It's a mini invasive technique. And it, it gives very good results with, uh, uh, with low, uh, low damage uh, compared to a usual surgery. And the time the, 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 the patient has a, has a rendezvous in the, in the hospital, uh, so they make uh, they made the CT scan just before the radio frequency ablation, and was the, when they have discovered it is the, met the metastasis has grown a lot, and the, the size uh, in December was too large in order to uh, to to do uh, radio frequency ablation. So what they decided is to do uh, standard chemotherapy in order in order to decrease the size, and then to do the, the radio frequency ablation. But the question that asked us uh, our contact in Bordeaux, so it's Jean Palipier, which is uh, responsible for uh, all the emerging department, the question that he asked us was the following one. If I give you this CT scan here, so in June 2008, if I give you this one, are you able to estimate that the size of the metastasis will, uh, will, be, uh, will be that in December? And you see all the clinical uh, applications that you, you can have, if you are able Starting from the scan to the growth that you, that you will have and to estimate the site that you will have uh, three months after means that you don't have to spend three months before doing something. So the clinical application for them, for the medical doctor and system is clear. Are we able to give an estimate of the time for which the metastasis will be less than three centimeters, let's say three centimeters, in order to be able to do uh, the radio frequency uh, ablation? And so we decided to try to build some mathematical model using the data, this is the data containing the CT scan. So two images, it's not, it seems to be not, uh, not a lot of information. If you think only in terms of volume of the, of the lesion, it's not a lot. But if you think to the quantity of pixels that moves from here to here, you have a lot of degree of freedom. And so if you are able to use all these degree of freedom, you may have some, uh, uh, some chance to, uh, to, to obtain a, a, right, a right estimation. And so we, in order to, uh, to, to give a, a general context, we, the question we wish like to answer are the following one. For a given pathology and for a given passion, when, when to start a treatment, when to stop a treatment, and when to change a treatment. It's very concrete questions that the clinician uh, ask themselves each time they have a new passion that, uh, that, that is coming in the, in the hospital. For some, I mean, for, for most of the patients, for most of the, of the pathologies, in fact, uh, the answer is known. So you start doing the surgery and then you, you have a, a protocol for chemotherapy or targeted treatment. And so you have no, uh, I mean, there is no need for, for mathematical modeling. But for very, for specific, uh, specific pathology and specific patients, for example, like the one I showed you before, this, is a, this kind of question are meaningful. So in the first step, I will show you uh, what, we are, what we are able to do uh, for, uh, for, the, for lung metastasis. And then I will show you another example for liver metastasis. So the, the general strategy that we have to, uh, to address this problem is the following one. First, we want to, to design a nonlinear PDE model. So as I was saying in the introduction, I come from the PDE world. So when from continuous mechanics when we use PDE model in order to describe the reality. And so we want to design, uh, we want to design a nonlinear PDE model. Uh, in the context of biology or medical, uh, medical sciences, there is no general law uh, that you can apply. So you have to design the PDE model by using some biological knowledge. So this part is very important. It has to be in a collaboration with, uh, with physician because uh, you, you have to be able to put some, uh, some biological fact in your model, but you have also to have in mind, and it is the, the meaning of C's arrow here, you have to have in mind what kind of data you will have. And so we want to use longitudinal multimodal data coming from imaging mainly, so it can be MRI, CT scan, and PET scan. And so you have to be aware about what kind of data and what will be uh, the usefulness of your, of your data for, uh, for a typical patient. In order to design your model, it's useless to have a very precise model if you have no data to, to calibrate the model. 
if you want to do real applications, if you want to, to, to describe only qualitative stuff, it's okay. But if you want to apply it to a, to a real clinical question, you have to design your model uh, knowing which kind of data can be used. Then the very difficult part is to proceed to the data assimilation process. Because you have your non-leader RPD model. In your model, you have some coefficient. Okay, you, have, you may have some different coefficient. You may have to some, some proliferation coefficient. But of course, from your data coming from, uh, from, uh, from, the, uh, from the patient, there is no way to, to read this kind of coefficient on your, uh, on your MRI or on, your, or on the CT scan. And so you have to, to do some data assimilation process in order to calibrate your model. That means in order to, uh, to find the best value of the parameter in the linear PD model that will describe the, the data that you have for your patient. Once you have, uh, sorry, once you have uh, proceeded to this data assimilation process, in fact, the simulation part and the prediction part is pretty easy. It's usually it consists in solving a, a 2D or 3D uh, system of PDEs with a few uh, few stiffness, and so it's it's quite an easy job. The simulation part and the prediction is quite an easy job once you have proceeded to the data assimilation process. So this is the general strategy, and now I will uh, I will show you. Uh, Show you an example how we can, uh, it can work. So modeling of, uh, about tumor growth, uh, there's uh, some facts that you want to, uh, to use uh, for modeling, uh, modeling cancer. Basically, what is in, important from the clinical uh, point of view is, is the, the, two last, uh, the two last points, the angiogenesis, angiogenesis process. It is a process that, uh, in which uh, the tumor Builds its own web of blood vessels in order to get nutrients and oxygen. It's a critical step of, uh, of uh, tumor growth, and it's also the way the, the tumor can grow, and it's also the way the tumor can spread metastasis uh, at uh, distant locations in the body. Okay, so this, and if you want to do something that, that clinically has, uh, has a meaning, you have, in some sense, to have this kind of process uh, that is described in your model. And moreover, the, the, the new targeted therapies that are used now clinically for, have been used maybe for 10 years, they, they, they target this, uh, most of the therapy targets this kind, of, uh, this kind of process and are inhibitors of the angiogenesis. So if you want to describe also the, uh, quantify the effect of, uh, of the therapies, you have any way to describe, uh, to describe this point. At the time being, for clinical application, it's uh, it's hopeless to go at the, at, the genetic, uh, at the genetic level. We will have to use uh, information from, coming from uh, the, gen the genome of the patient when they, it's available. But at the time being now, it's, uh, it's really too difficult uh, to use this information uh, using and to couple it with, uh, quantitatively, I mean, with, uh, with imaging data. Okay, so the different ingredients that we want to use uh, some basic elements. So the first basic element is that we have to describe several populations of cells, calcium cells, proliferative cells, and for some kind of tumor, I think, for example, for glioblastomas, you have to use, uh, you have to use uh, invasive cells. But at least the two first ones have to be used, and basically the ratio between creation and calcium and proliferative cells will uh, describe the, the, ag the aggressivity of the, of the tumor. Then you have to describe, in some sense, vascularization and the androgenesis because it's uh, mainly it's one of the main control of tumoral growth through the quantity of oxygen and nutrients that are available. And then, so these biological facts and biological uh, elements, you have to describe the way the tumor will spread and, uh, and grow. And so what I do, it's, uh, we decided with uh, my collaborators to, uh, to use a global velocity and this global velocity has nothing to do uh, with the velocity of cells that can have, uh, undergo some motility process. It's a global velocity that will describe the way the tumor is growing. And so it's uh, something you can think, uh, think to this global velocity as being uh, the velocity field that you need to transform the first image into the second one. So it's really, uh, you can imagine that there is a continuous process there is a continuous process anyway between the first uh, CT scan and the second one. And so there is, uh, you can think of this velocity as being the, the velocity field that is responsible for this, uh, for this movement. Of course, this velocity field won't be divergence-free because you are, uh, you are in a context where the, the 
the volume is not conserved and you have an increase of volume. You have also to model uh, drugs, so it will depend from which treatment you, you are dealing with. And any, uh, so it's a very, the last point is a very pragmatic point of view. It's any other ingredient that you can use in order to, uh, to use the information that are in the image. So for example, if I, I think to uh, diffusion MRI or perfusion MRI that we have not used uh, yet, but yet, but if we if you want, if you have data coming from perfusion MRI, for example, you may have to add some information in your model in order to be able to use this information. Okay, now, what kind of uh, biological information can you put in the model? So it's, uh, here you can see on the screen, uh, so lung tumor uh, coming from the uh, anatomopathologist. And so what you have here on the top, it's a normal histology of a lung with a different scale. So you can see the alveolas and the, the membrane. And below you have two kinds of, uh, of, uh, of lung tumors. The first one is a lung carcinoma. So it's a, what you call usually a lung cancer. So it's a primitive tumor that is growing on the, that is growing on the, on the lung. And so there is in the middle a necrosis and you have a, a zone here which is uh, uh, with a high proliferative rate uh, probably. And here you see, uh, so it's, this part here is uh, the LC tissue, and here in the, there is an intermediate zone when it's not, it's not clear to see if it's uh, already lung tumor, or it's, uh, but it's, it's clear it's not LC tissue anymore. And so you can, if you see that on the imaging, uh, on the image, uh, on the CT scan, what, what you see is something which is uh, just like an infiltrative phenomena, something uh, with diffusion. So if you want mathematically now to describe this reality spatially, what, what you will need, it's probably to use some models that will uh, involve some diffusion process in order to describe that you have something, a uh, big ball at the, uh, in the middle, and then something which is decreasing, and finally, that is infiltrating uh, the, the LC tissues. On the left here, you have a metastasis in the lung, but a metastasis of a thyroid cancer. And so metastasis, it's uh, cells coming from the thyroid, that are growing into the, into the lung, and basically that are, these, uh, these cells are, are building a, a piece of thyroid into the lung. And so what you see here is something, is, uh, so it's very different, there is a big difference between the, the, the tumoral part and the, the LC tissue. And as you can see, the difference between both is very sharp. And here you have something which is with really two, uh, two components that are quite clear, and you would like uh, to, to describe this phenomena by, uh, by uh, using a front, using something which is very sharp. And so in terms of mathematical modeling, you want to use here something which is more like a hyperbolic equation. So using, if you want some mechanical analogy, you, uh, you, will, uh, you would like to use some, uh, uh, some convection, convection type uh, model in order to describe uh, this phenomenon. So it's a way you can take into account uh, the, the biology into the, into the model. Here you want to, uh, for primary tumor, you want to use more diffusion process. Here you want to use more convection and hyperbolic equation. And so, second part, I will show you how we, we have deal with the metastasis to the lung. And so we have used a very simple, uh, very simplified model for metastasis to the lung. And so this very simplified model just made like that. We use the one proliferating phase. Uh, so it's a, a phase P in which the cells are dividing. And we impose that the, the proliferating rate is not constant. And this proliferating rate will depend on the quantity of oxygen M. And this quantity of oxygen M will depend from time and also from the place where you are into, into the inside of the tumor, okay? And so that means that the proliferative rate will also, will also depend on time and uh, space. And so you will have uh, some kind of heterogeneity of the proliferation inside the tumor. It will depend at which place in the tumor uh, you are looking at. Then you need something to describe the angiogenesis process. And so we introduce a vogf like marker uh, that is secreted by tumor cell, especially the one. So uh, VOGF stands for uh, vascularization endothelial growth factor. It's something, it's a molecule that, uh, it's a set of molecules that are created by, uh, 
by tumor cells in order to uh, attract uh, the endothelial cell. The endothelial cells are the cells that are making the, uh, the blood vessel. And so when these, so the, these cells move from existing blood vessel and build new blood vessel. And so we decided to use uh, something like that, the VOGF-like marker, in order to describe this phenomenon. And then, as I said before, we need this global velocity that will describe the collective moment and that will allow us to, to fit uh, the model with, uh, with the data and to describe the spatial evolution of the tumor, not only its, vo its volume. Some equation. So first equation, so it's uh, the equation that satisfies as the population of proliferative cells. So we use density of cells. So you can think of P uh, moving between zero, uh, zero and one. And so the left-hand part gives uh, the, the, basically the conservation of P cells and the, the right-hand side, uh, gamma P stands for proliferation, gamma D for death. And so it's proliferation because of tumoral growth and death due to, to epoxy. Epoxy is the, leg, the lack of oxygen that makes them die because, of, because they don't have enough nutrient of oxygen. And so the growth rate, growth and death rate are given by this formula. Basically, the ton, uh, hyperbolic tangents are just here to move from minus one to plus one. And so what is important here in this formula, it's uh, you have maximal growth rate, which is gamma zero, maximum death rate, which is gamma one. And you have uh, this threshold here uh, that you can think to this threshold as being the hypoxia threshold. And above this threshold, the tangent hyperbolic basically is equal to plus one. And so the growth rate is equal to gamma zero. Above this threshold, the hyperbolic tangent is equal to minus one, and the growth rate is equal to zero. And the same here, above the hypoxia threshold, there is, not enough, ox there is enough oxygen, and so the death rate is zero. And above, uh, below this, uh, this threshold, the, uh, there is not enough oxygen, and the, growth, uh, the death rate is equal to one. So above the threshold, enough oxygen, you have proliferation. Above this threshold, not enough oxygen, you have death. Okay? Uh, and this, uh, this formula makes uh, the, this phenomena continuous, and so you can have some intermediate configuration. Now, if you deal a little bit with the equation and you say that uh, you make some saturation hypothesis, so you say that in some in some size in in some box in the in the tissue you can only have a maximum number of, uh, of cells, you obtain that uh, the, the divergence of the velocity has to be equal to this quantity here. In continuous mechanics, the divergence of the velocity is the, uh, exactly uh, the, uh, the increase of the volume. So what I said by writing this equation, it's only that the increase of the volume is equal to the variation of numbers of qualified cells. Okay? Of course, to have the divergence of the velocity field, it's not enough to compute the velocity. I have to give, uh, to close the system, and I close the system using the Darcy's law. That means that I say that the velocity is equal, is equal to minus the gradient of, uh, of the pressure. That means that uh, if you have the increase of volume, the pressure is increased. And if, the, if you have an increase of pressure, it pushes uh, it push the cells in, uh, in the opposite direction of the gradient of pressure, V goes minus gradient, uh, gradient of pi. It's a very simple law. But um, at the time being, I have no idea and no, and no need to use something more, more complicated. The equation of the VOGF, so this is an endothelial growth factor, we decided to use only a scalar, a scalar function, in order to describe, uh, to say that, okay, since I have a set of P cells, there is a secretion of VOGF globally around the tumor, and this secretion is responsible for, for the formation of new blood vessel. Of course, there are a lot of very uh, much more complicated and much more precise model of angiogenesis, but if I use more complicated model, I will have the problem to, to find the parameter and to make the calibration from the available uh, available data. And at the time being, I'm not able to use uh, to use more complicated model from uh, for the OGF, knowing the, the data that I have. Uh, that, I can, uh, that can, uh, I can use for the patient I showed. And then I describe the quantity of oxygen by saying that basically uh, there is a consumption, here system is a consumption of oxygen by the tumor, and here is the production 
of the oxygen due to the angiogenesis process. So it's quite similar, a very, very simplified model compared to the real biological uh, complexity of the system. But as you can see, it's already uh, a set of PDE with some parameters that I have to, uh, to fix in some sense. And so uh, this model, uh, sometimes it's useful to do mathematics, not always, but in this case it's useful because this model has been been built uh, only from uh, practical and for, for empirical, uh, empirical means, and so there is absolutely no uh, no guarantee that uh, that it satisfies the set of uh, of good property. And it's uh, it's it can be shown that anyways uh, the, the density of cells will stay between zero and one for all times. And so the velocity field also is outgoing on the binary of the computational domain. So that means that these properties are satisfied mathematically by the system, and so that you, you will need a uh, numerical scheme that satisfies also the same property. It's very important because it's uh, basically that p stays between 0 and 1 has been used to prescribe the, the condition divergence of v equals something. Okay? So it's important that numerically you satisfy the same, the same condition. Okay, now what is the problem? I have a, I have a, a set of parameters, so mainly, basically, you can forget uh, K2 over K1, but you have uh, six or seven parameters involved in the system, and of course, the only data that I have is the image I show you on the first slide. And so I have to find, in fact, uh, a set of values of the parameter in such a way that, that, uh, that this quantity here is the smallest as possible. So what is this quantity? This quantity in red, here you have the data, so it's the density of tumor cells that you, can, that you can read on the CT scan. So you've made the assumption, which is not completely false, that the, the, the intensity, in fact, of the CT scan can be related to the density of tumor cells. It's partially false because the, the, the density in the CT scan, it's, uh, it's really uh, proportional to the density of the tissue and not directly to the density of tumor cells. But okay, we make the approximation here. And then P of T1 and P of T2 uh, are the, the quantities that are computed by the PDE model. So you, may, you choose a, a set of parameters, you make your simulation, you find PT1, PT2, you compute this quantity here. If you, look, if you want to look to discrete quantity, you, you, you build this stuff here, and so you make the sum of all the pixels that are available on your CT scan. And you want to find the value of the parameter here in order that this quantity is the smallest as possible. Okay? The way we did that is uh, by, using, by working two steps. The first step is a Monte Carlo algorithm in order to, uh, to, to find something reasonable. And then once we have isolated something which is, uh, for which the, the, this quantity here is not, it's not too big, we use a gradient method in order to, uh, to increase uh, the accuracy. Okay. This is the general framework, and now you have to deal with uh, the real data and try to, to make it work. So the f another test case on which uh, we have worked is um, uh, progression without treatment. So it's the example I show you here. It's uh, a patient that has a thyroid uh, cancer. Uh, one of the, it, it, it's one of the thyroid cancers that is not sensible to the to, to, uh, radiologic treatment so with, with yod. And so he has a lot of metastases that, that have appeared. There is one here, another one here, as you can see, uh, another, another one here. And so we have followed this one uh, here. So you can see it starting in 2005 and until 2009, so almost four years. It's a very slow growth compared to that I showed you before, okay? because from here to here, you have, five, uh, you have four years. And as you can see, the increase of volume is not, uh, is not big. So the way uh, they, they follow this kind of fashion, they just monitor them regularly. So they, they undercut the CT scan every six months, basically. And when the metastasis is going too much, or if something uh, appears on TEP scan, they do a radiofrequency ablation. Okay? For this patient, uh, if I remember well, he had something like uh, 25 metastasis. So Anyway, it was uh, a place to do uh, a global treatment. Okay, and so what we did, we have, uh, we have used the two first CT 
scan and apply the strategy I told you before, uh, process two first CT scan. And so this is the result that we obtain. So I have drawn here uh, in this direction is the time in months. So as you can see, it's uh, a little bit more than four years. And here you have the, you have the volume of the, the metastasis. Okay. And so the circle here are the volume of the lesions that are measured um, by the physician on the CT scan and the, the black box is a simulation. So again, we do not, we do not work on the, on the volume itself uh, as a scalar quantity. We make the simulation of the spatial distribution of cells. And then once we have predicted the spatial distribution, we compute the volume that is occupied by the lesion uh, numerically. Okay, so see, what I show you, it's uh, an indirect uh, representation of the result, which, but, which is easy to, uh, to understand. So we have used the two first points, and as you can see, the results here are not, uh, are not too bad. We are particularly proud of this uh, red square here, because we have made the simulation before they made the CT scan. So we made the simulation, give, we give them uh, the curves, and then they make the CT scan and, and measure uh, the, the, the size of the, of the metastasis on the CT scan, and as you can see, it's, uh, it's right on the, on the curve. This is the result spatially. So above you have the, the real tumor that is obtained by a segmentation tool uh, on the CT scan. So it's uh, the third and fourth scan. And this is the, the result that is given by the simulation. It's far from being perfect. If you look, I mean, if you present something like that in fluid mechanics or in solid mechanics, it, it will be considered as a bad result. In this context, it's, uh, it's a pretty good. You have some defect on the shape and, uh, and also um, probably on the density, but basically it's not, uh, it's quite satisfactory. Another test case, test case, which is less satisfactory, it was a kidney tumor. And the patient had two metastases, one in the, in the left lung here, and one here in the, in the right lung. Okay? And so the same, same kind of problem. You take this picture here, this one, the first one and second one, and you try to, uh, to predict the third one. And the same for all, uh, for the second one. So the same patient, same uh, primitive tumor, which is a, a kidney, and two different uh, metastases. And the results are the following one. For the left part, it's okay. The result is, pre is pretty good, the first time before. And for the second one, uh, I show you two curves here. Yeah, the first one, the black one, which is uh, give a good result. But the other one is also given by the, the resolution of the inverse problem. That means that in this case, I, uh, I find two sets of solutions, and I have really, really no, no idea, uh, except knowing the third point, I have no idea to choose between the two solutions. So that means that in this case, I will be in a, in a context uh, for, for which uh, I'm completely unable to answer, the, to answer the question. One of the curves is really an exponential growth, and the other one has some kind of saturation process. Now it's, uh, I will show you the case we started before. It's a case with, uh, with, uh, with the chemotherapy. So, you have the, the growth uh, without treatment here. So uh, you arrive at the hospital at this point uh, in Bordeaux. So they started almost immediately the chemotherapy. So in March, the lesion uh, has decreased a lot. And so the metastasis is much smaller. In May, it's almost at the end of the treatment. Uh, the decrease of the, of the metastasis is, is quite nice. But as soon as they stop the chemo, uh, it started to grow again, and in July uh, it was uh, significantly growth, significantly big, and so they made uh, they made the radio frequency in fact the day after, and it was okay with his metastasis. The patient has no, had no problem anymore with uh, at the range. So at the end, the treatment uh, the treatment was okay, and so the result that we have again we can use so the two first. CT scan and try to predict uh, the, first, uh, the third one. And see the result that, uh, that we obtain here. Again, here you have the curves uh, describing the volume. So the, the, the point here, the cross, are the volume measured by segmentation on, uh, on the CT scan. And the curves, continuous curves, is the prediction. 
And you can see here the prediction that uh, the computation that we obtain specially for, uh, for this metastasis. Again, the shape is not, uh, is not exactly good and is, there is clearly some problem with, uh, uh, with the result, but overall the, the volume is not bad. In fact, what I said is not completely true. If you see, if you look here at the error on the volume, uh, it's pretty big, man, it's almost 30%. But what is important from the clinic of view, it's this quantity here, it's the horizontal error. So it's the time for which you reach some, uh, some critical growth, some critical size, because this is what is important from the, from the practical point of view. For the, uh, for the chemo, again, we use, so the last, we use the last CT scan here, before the chemotherapy, and the, the second one in bit, uh, between, uh, I mean, during the chemotherapy, in order to see if we are able to evaluate uh, what will we have uh, at the end. And so, uh, in red, again, it's the result of the computation. And here you have the volume with respect to time. So uh, we have used the six point here, six point here. And as you can see, the curve has some, some strange behavior. You have first a very, very stiff decrease and then something which is quite linear, okay? So what we did in this case, we, we, we performed the simulation until the end of the treatment, and then we decide to grow again uh, the tumor using the coefficient that has been determined in the first step, okay? And so this part of the curve here is uh, the result of the simulation uh, with the parameter uh, using in, uh, that is describing the growth uh, without treatment. And as you can see, it's not too bad in terms of uh, the estimation of the, of the site. Uh, in order to conclude this part, one case that is, uh, that is not working good, uh, uh, in some sense, uh, again, uh, lung metastasis, I don't remember from which, which was the primitive tumor, but anyway, we obtain a, a lot of different solutions. That are, they are almost all uh, good for the, for the two first point. And you, you can see here, you have a huge variability of the result. That means that in this case, it just at the time being, using the, the model, the data that we have, it's hopeless to, 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 to obtain some, some prediction. Okay, so the conclusion of our modeling of lung metastasis. Uh, right now, we are, uh, we are performing an evaluation of a large set of patients. So it's 20 patients selected by the Institut Vergonier. So the Institut Vergonier, it's... Uh, is a hospital specialized on cancer therapy in Bordeaux. And so we tried uh, the, the algorithm on this set of patients without trying to, uh, to succeed, so just to make an evaluation of the performance. Okay? The computation of uh, the type show you are all made uh, with a uh, homemade code that is developed by uh, Olivier So. It's in C++, MPI, and the image processing part is based on VTK. And from the numerical point of view, it's uh, fine volume schemes on Cartesian grid, and mostly all the convection parts are done using a fifth order when uh, scheme for the transport and splitting strategy in time. Okay, in order to, uh, so maybe I have five minutes or something like that, I will show you just uh, the problematic that can uh, occur for metastasis to the liver. Uh, so the, the image that uh, you can see here is a CT scan of the liver of a patient that has a metastasis here. So it can be seen in uh, September uh, 2008. It's a metastasis of a, of a GIST. A GIST is a gastrointestinal stromal tumor. It's something that basically there is no, no, no treatment to cure the disease, but there are two kinds of treatment that can be used in order to, uh, to control the disease uh, on quite a large time scale. And so uh, a typical, uh, typical profile uh, that you can obtain for a patient, so this curve there that you can see, it's not a simulation, it's just uh, experimental uh, measurement. The circle here are the volume of the lesion that you can measure on CT scan, so the patient has a lot of uh, CT scan. So it, the metastasis was discovered at this point here, then he received a treatment which is, uh, the commercial name is Glizek, it's uh, imatinib. 
Usually, uh, these kind of treatments are, are efficient on most patients, but at some time they escape from the treatment, it's what you see here. So usually they switch the treatment, and so you receive an antiogenic drug, which is a sutent, it's a sunatinib, so it's a different kind of treatment, and again, uh, an escape, uh, he escapes uh, the treatment. So the interest, if we can, I mean, the interest from the clinical point of view, could be to, uh, to give an estimate of the time on which this, uh, this uh, relapse to the treatment will, uh, will occur. And are we able to, uh, to, to give such an estimate? If you are able to give uh, such an estimate, that means that you can change the treatment before the lesion becomes too big, okay? which is interesting for, uh, for the patient. The answer is, uh, so I have no time to, to explain you uh, what, we did, uh, what we did exactly. So we used, uh, we have built a PDE model that involves popula different population of cells, some of them that are resistant to the treatment and some of them that are not resistant to the, to the treatment. So I switch, uh, I switch some slides. So for this kind of model, you, you need all this kind of information, three population of P cells, some of them that are uh, sensitive to the two kinds of drugs, P2 that will be sensitive only to anti-angiogenic drug, and P3 that be sensitive to none of the of this drug. You need healthy tissues, and if you look now to the, uh, I come back, uh, I come back to the, to the CT scan. If you look the scan on September, for example, you can see that there is a, a huge heterogeneity of the lesion. The center of the lesion is dark, and the the, the, the ring. The outside, uh, outside rim is, uh, is, is more clear. The dark on the CT scan, it's uh, the water. That means you have necrosis inside in the middle of the, in the, middle of the region, and you have probably proliferative cells in the, in, the, uh, in the outside part. That means that if you want to use uh, the data that are included in the, in the CT scan, you have to describe the, the, the quantity of necrosis inside, uh, inside the tumor cells. So that's why uh, in the population of cells, we have, add, uh, we have added the necrotic tissue. And again, uh, we use the blood flux and uh, a VOGF type uh, indicator, and uh, of course, the global velocity that is responsible for the extension of the decay of the tumor tissue. And so I go directly to the, uh, I don't show, uh, you can have a look to the, to the system. It's not very different from the, the one that we use for the, for the lung. Here's the result that we, uh, what we obtained. So in red, it's uh, the, the measurement of the, of the size of the lesion on the CT scan. And in blue, it's uh, the, the volume that is uh, reconstructed uh, coming from the numerical simulation. So it's not bad. What is the difference with the part of the lung? This curve that I show you, this result here, it's not a prediction, it's a fit. So we have, uh, we have tried to find a good set of parameters that is able to keep the curves that fits all the data, all the curves. That means that uh, it's not predictive at all. For example, if I, I decide to cut here at 16, uh, 600 days, here, so in, uh, around two years, I have a several set of parameters that will fit almost, uh, that will fit this curve, uh, this curve, this part of the curve uh, quite well, but the relapse will be at different times. Could be here, could be here. So that means that this part here, in fact, is not predictive. If I speak only in terms of size, this part here is not predictive of the relapse time. So that means that the model, mm, if I use only volume, and if I use only size of the lesion, I have no chance to, uh, to be able to predict uh, the, the relapse. And so what was, uh, what was the idea? So this is another patient here, and you can see the same kind of behavior and the same kind of result, even if this one, it's not, it's not very good. It's not so good on the first one. And so what is the idea? The idea is to use, uh, is to use the, the structure of the tumor. If you look now to this data here, you can see, like, as I said before, the tumor is very heterogeneous, and it's uh, really uh, a characteristic of these, uh, of these tumors. The gist are uh, gastrointestinal stromal tumors. They are known for being very heterogeneous. And so the idea now, it's a, it's a collaboration that we have with the General Electric, 
uh, and so the the idea uh, is to use this picture here to draw an histogram of the intensity of the of the lesion to perform some uh, some algorithm of the Gaussian mixture, for example, in order to uh, to, to to have uh, to identify two kinds or several kinds of population of pixels and to, to identify some, uh, some, some probability density for a pixel to, uh, to, to belong to one of the class and to try to, uh, to have some, uh, some identity uh, and some indicators, sorry, from the indicators of the heterogeneity of the tumor with respect, uh, with respect to time. And so if we are able to connect now this, uh, the variation of this heterogeneity with some clinical uh, facts, uh, the slight uh, the relapse, there is a hope from the image to be able to, to, to describe uh, the, or to estimate the relapse time. But as you can see, it's, uh, it can be done at the time with the model that we have. It can only be done using the structure of the metastasis and not only the, its, uh, its size. What is the conclusion of all this, uh, this work? First, we would like uh, to, to extend the, the strategy and its, uh, its ongoing work for meningiomas. So meningiomas are intracranial tumors with a slow growth, and some, most of them are benign, and some of them need to, be, uh, to undergo surgery or radiotherapy. And so we just want to do the same thing that we have, we have developed for the lung but for the menagiomas, in order to estimate the growth and to decide when you have to do something that, which is, I mean, in, in, in the head, something which is quite aggressive to, to, to make a radiotherapy, so you want to avoid to do that if you don't need to do that. And so we want to apply the same kind of strategy for menagiomas. And even if uh, biologically they are very different, uh, technically it's, uh, it's lesions that are very localized with a slow growth, and also it's a uh, menagioma as a tumor from basically from the bones, not from the brain. And so it's uh, something with a very sharp interface. And really, uh, graphic graphically, it really looks like metastasis to the lung. And so it, the same kind of techniques probably can be, uh, can, can be done. And the first results are quite, that we have obtained are quite uh, encouraging. We work uh, with uh, Hassan Fatala, which is a neurologist in uh, University of Alabama at Birmingham on glioblastomas, and the idea is in this case to try to, be, to say something on the escape time and the relapse time on the population of patients that are uh, uh, treated with avastin, uh, with avastin uh, for uh, glioblastoma. And technically, at the timing, we have only using morphological information, morphological imaging. And so we, there is a need of using information coming from functional imaging. So in progress, again, we are, uh, we are trying to use perfusion MRI for both for lung tumor and kidney tumor. So for primitive tumor, not for metastasis, but for primitive tumor and lung tumor and for kidney tumor. And uh, again, the idea is to, to use the structure really of the, to have some insight of the structure of the tumor using the functional uh, the functional imaging in order to increase the accuracy of the, of the, of the estimate. And of course, it will be impossible to avoid to, to make study on population of patients to see if it's possible to quantify the interindividual inter variability. And if, uh, a contrario, if it's possible to have uh, some of the coefficients that, that will be, uh, well, some of the parameters that will be. Uh, almost constant for, uh, for a population of patients. In order to conclude, uh, my collaborators subject at the math department a set of people, Angelo Iolo, Olivier So, Claire Poignard, Damien de Lombardi, and Jean-Baptiste Lagarde. So the two last ones now are in Paris, and the, the three first ones are in, uh, in Bordeaux. It's all, fa they are all faculty. There are some PhD students. Uh, at the Bordeaux University Hospital, François Cornelis, which is a, which is a radiologist, which is doing uh, uh, interventional radiology and is dealing also with kidney, kidney cancer. Hugo Oiseau, which is a neurosurgeon, 
and Thibaut Hazard, which is a radio radiotherapist and dealing of, uh, <coughs> most of his time on a for intracranial tumor. At the Institut Vergonier, which is the hospital specialized in cancer therapy, Jean Palucière is uh, at the head of the imaging department, and Guy Cantor is a radiotherapist, and at UAD, uh, at Santa Fe for uh, neuro-oncology. So thank you very much for uh, your attention. Uh, again, I'm sorry for my, my typical French accent. So if you have some questions. Um, thank, thank you very much, Harry. Your accent was very clear. We could understand it. So it was, it was great. Very nice talk. Uh, do people have questions they'd like to ask? Speaking. I, I can ask a question. Um, given the hepatitis, I was wondering whether a uh, agent-based modeling was something that you had considered, and if so, if you had compared that to your uh, closed-form models. Uh, it's it's very difficult to make a, a comparison with uh, with an agent-based model because the, the the problem is that how you will. Uh, how can you calibrate the agent-based model uh, starting from uh, uh, from the imaging data? We made some comparison on, uh, in, a, in an abstract setting. So if you take, uh, uh, if you make some, some, I mean, some in silico, purely in silico simulation, and basically what you will obtain is the same kind of uh, same kind of behavior. Okay, but you know, if you want now to calibrate from uh, From from real data, it, it's not so easy to make a meaning, uh, meaningful comparison. Okay. Uh, other questions, people? There's no way to make a comparison. I think Jacob Barhack, you had a question? No. Oh, I can speak. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. We hear you. Oh. Okay. So you've been showing a bunch of models there. So. Um, how do you validate them, actually? Because you probably don't have a lot of information to go against. So you can make a lot of assumptions, run them, and then again, at the end, what do you validate them against? OK. So we, uh, when we design a model, we, first we, we, we work with the medical doctor in order to try to answer some, uh, to address some clinical questions. And then we look at the data that are available, and we try to put in the model only elements that, are, uh, that, that we think we have a chance to calibrate with the data. Okay? And after that, the only uh, validation that I can add is when uh, I'm able to calibrate the model using, I mean, solving an inverse problem uh, on the data I have. And usually, uh, the example that I show you is uh, I have at least three scans, okay, at least three. And what we do, we calibrate the model using the two first one, and we try to recover the third one. I have no better, I have no better uh, criteria in order to validate my model at the time being. Okay, but so you don't have a lot of data to work against. So you're working mostly on assumptions, if I understand correctly, and those come with clinical sources, doctor's knowledge, basically. Excuse me, I so didn't catch the last part. Uh, Basically, you are building assumptions that come from clinical knowledge accumulated in the doctor's brain, basically. The, the knowledge that they have, and you build up for, upon them, and you validate 3 to 1, 2 to 1. This is approximately your level of validation. Uh, did you try alternative models, like several alternatives to run them against each other? Did I try? Sorry, I didn't. Alternative models, like you have Half one, model one, model two, model three, and then you test them against each other, make them compete. You try something like that. Yes, yes, yes. We have a, well, the model that I showed you, that I, that I showed you, is not the first one that we have tried. Okay, we have, especially for the uh, for the description of the oxygen of the quantity of oxygen, we have used, the first model that, that has been used. It's uh, we say that the oxygen was. Uh, was solving some diffusion equation. Something which is quite natural to say that you have the diffusion of oxygen into the tissue. 
But this kind of model, in fact, are not accurate at all to, uh, to be solved by, uh, to be put in the inverse problem. Because to, uh, I mean, to solve some inverse problem with a diffusion equation, you know that something is uh, technically very unstable. Okay? And so we decided to switch, uh, to, switch to another, another type of model that is the one that we do. Okay? The, the problem is of the validation is that the model in itself is not very important. The point, uh, yeah, sorry, okay. of course it's important, but the, which is important is the coupling of the model, data, and data simulation. A good model that cannot be, uh, that cannot be calibrated from the data is useless. And it's, uh, in fact, it's not a good model at all. Okay? So it's, a, it's really model data and data assimilation which is important. I think we have another question. Yes. Yes. Thank you. I'm Fayoja from Virginia Tech. Um, I saw mostly that you, you are using partial equations to model uh, what's going on there. And from my understanding, um, your input uh, data are coming from the images. Um, you, you mentioned things like uh, maybe some, some hormones, the EGF things like that, uh, but I believe that you don't have a chance to measure those hormones all over the body. And so basically everything, all of the data are coming from images, and at the end your criterion was like, looked like to me at least, uh, as a single variable, uh, the curves, the precise curves, etc., etc. Is that we think maybe um, using PDEs is kind of an over design? Maybe ODEs might do a better work, or like simpler explanations or simpler models might give simpler answers or more realistic answers? Okay, I, I use, uh, we decided to use, I mean, if you use ODE and you, and you focus on, only on scalar quantity, for example, for example, the volume of the tumor, that means that for a particular patient, you will have two data, two degrees of freedom. With two degrees of, of freedom, it's, uh, it's just hopeless. You can, you can have multiple differential equations. You can, you can have a system of uh, ODEs. That's, that's not the issue. The, with the PDEs, the way I see, you, you went through the PDEs because your data are coming from a special, uh, like large anatomic uh, body volume where you try to simulate uh, the processes that are going on. But you don't have access to the, to, you just have access whatever the imaging tells you. Maybe, maybe with CT you could do oxygenation. I, I, I'm not a CT expert, but definitely uh, if, I, if I haven't misunderstood, you don't have means to find out, for instance, the hormone distribution, uh, whatever the cancer hormone, whatever the cancer uh, genes distribution by looking at the images. Right, but there are, I know that there are some modalities that do that with special uh, bio, uh, special markers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but in your case, uh, that wasn't the issue. So basically, what I'm trying to understand is, uh, you, do you use imaging because you are using imaging data? Uh, PDEs are more uh, suitable for the work because the data are coming from a spatial environment, from the whole body. PDEs are more um, uh, suitable rather than trying to put many, many, many ordinary differential equations or, or have a large system of uh, or di ordinary differential equations. Yes, That's yes, you're right. It's, uh, it's, uh, I mean, the data that I have, it's, uh, I have an approximation of P of Tx. Okay? So uh, the data that I have from the image, it's the, the, the density of proliferative cells at different different position and different time. So, uh, I mean, if we try to design a, a system of ODE, but the problem is that uh, how can I translate the information including in the CT scan to information that I can put in an ODE system? Okay, I can take the volume, I can take the diameter of the lesion, and then I, if, I, if I just uh, limit my, uh, my description to that... If, no, if you have any... If you have any uh, evidence-based information about that, say that you don't care about the whole body, it's it's possible. It's just the tumor area that you were uh, you were showing in the first images 
that you are interested. Maybe just taking a couple of pixels around the, those tumor area in the volume will suffice. Then let's say you have, I don't know, 10,000 pixels. So you have an OD of 1,000 uh, state variables. I'm just making this up. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any evidence uh, saying that the, a continuous description uh, with PDEs is more uh, advantageous than this kind of discretized version of the... Uh, exactly system? the same. Because uh, I write, uh, I write, uh, I, make, I, I make a discretization of my PDE with on exactly the the pixel, uh, the pixel of the of the image. So it's exactly. I mean, technically, at the end, what we use for, as a description numerically, it's exactly what you say. It's a big relationship between uh, between all the pixels. Numerically, I mean, the numerical mesh is exactly. The, the the mesh of the pixel exactly, but because there is no I mean there is no need to make something more precise, uh, and it's completely crazy to make something less precise. So to see exactly what you say, Thanks. except that I'm not able to write this, this huge system of OD, which is not so huge, so huge as you say because uh, it's maybe a, it's a couple of hundred of, uh, of pixels only. There, there is a there is a um, there is a theoretical issue and there is a practical issue. So those are two, those are two things. Like that's that's like you answered my practical question, but the theoretical question is still stands. If you wish, thanks. Yeah. Uh, how have you how have you found the reception among the oncologists? Have they wanted to use what you're able to provide? At the very least, despite the difficulties of validation, these models have got to be better than what they were using before, which is just uh, trends. I think. Is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah, no. The people in Bordeaux are uh, really the wait uh, to. Uh, they are waiting for uh, for us to, uh, to to give some prototype in order just just to check with new patients if the prediction are uh, quite correct and if, if they are meaningful in uh, in uh, in a clinical uh, in a clinical context. Uh, at the time being, what we need to do uh, really is to uh, to make some. So as you said, as I said before, the, to make an evaluation of the large set of patients, and also we have to design some some kind of ergonomic interface in order that they can run the program themselves. Because uh, I mean, the radiologists they are uh, they are just uh, behind the console of the of the, the G machine or the Philips machine, and so they, I mean, what they need to do. It's uh, it's really only uh, they want to say, to make the same at least the segmentation themselves, but afterwards it has to uh, the code uh, should be able to run uh, uh, alone. I mean they have no time and they, they also don't have the the ability uh, to, to 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 run uh, such a complicated uh, program by themselves. So there is a, there is an issue concerning ergon ergonomy of the. Uh, of the software, but no, they are very. I mean, it, such kind of, uh, of simulations that just answer one of their, of their questions. It, even if they, when they will use it, uh, it, it will be one part of the decision process. They, they will, uh, they will never rely, uh, strictly speaking, on a, on a numerical result. They will they will make a mixing of uh, of different elements that they have. So from the point of view, it's not very even in, if in some case the prediction fails. It's not so. I mean, for, for mathematician can be surprising if if, if it fails in 20 or 30 percent of the case. You can, you can say okay, it's not it's not so good for them. It's not such a problem because it's a, it's a part of a, uh, it will be a part of the picture. Yeah, very good. So I think we're running uh, short on time. Any other uh, pressing questions for Thierry? Uh, if not, uh, thank you again. And uh, it was an excellent uh, talk, very interesting. Thanks. Thank you. Anything else, uh, Grace, that we need to cover? Grace, you're muted. No, I just wanted to know if Jacob wanted to uh, voice his question on the chat. Um, well. It's about the models themselves. Uh, uh, hopefully, you can hear me now. So, uh, about the models themselves, uh, did you, there are several com 
people who are working on cancer models. I know specifically Alan Lafour. You might know him from computational surgery. Uh, he also has a tumor growth model there. Uh, unfortunately, the website is down, so I cannot send you a link. But uh, basically, uh, this is one name that I remember. Another, there are several groups that were in the Mount Hood Challenge in 2012 that presented work on cancer models. Uh, how do you, did you integrate with them? Did you try their models? Did you try to, you know, collaborate, compete, compare? It's a, uh, there are so many models for tumor growth that you can, I mean, you can read one model per day if you want. So uh, the, the point is that here we, we try to uh, we try to integrate uh, only the element that we need. And so sometimes we take a part that is coming from uh, Chaplin's team, sometimes that is coming from, some part that is coming from uh, Swanson's team. And, and so we, we integrate all the data, that, I mean, all the models that are, that are known. Again, uh, in order to use uh, to, to use imaging data that are available and for the particular pathology that we are dealing with. I don't know if I have answered your question, but uh, you're limited to what you're doing. But okay, the, the idea is to actually compare more, try to integrate with others because some of the ideas out there, some of the assumptions are better than others. If you make a, if you compete with others, you know which assumptions are better. But this is my perspective. But then again, okay, thank you. Uh, many anything else? Otherwise, uh, we'll finish up. Let us thank the speaker. Thank you, Terry. Thank you. Thank you.